This is Flick. This is Rudy. And this week, it's another installment of of covers for lovers here on the Left of the Doll podcast. It's uh, episode 47 of the Left of the Doll podcast. And our uh, feature this week is Big Star, the band Big Star. Uh, one of our mutual favorites, and I would say of our mutual of our mutual loves, uh, this is the one that, that means the most to me. Yeah, I'm surprised we went 47 episodes before doing a Big Star show, considering how much time we've I mean, we've gone to Memphis together specifically. I mean, if, if Arden wasn't there, how high on our list? I mean, we would have gone to Memphis. Memphis is a great place for music lovers. But, like, the, the main event there was getting to go to Arden, right? We've, we've been on this big star kick for 20 years, 25 years. Yeah, and, and that is, it, it is quite something to say that, you know, you would go to Memphis primarily to to see Arden because Memphis <laughs> does have so much. And yeah, I mean, like Stax, for instance, Stax, mm-hmm. Stax was a very meaningful place for me to visit as well. But but yeah, Arden, uh, Arden was the main drive to go there. Um, and yeah, it, we, didn't, we had, it did not disappoint. It didn't disappoint. And And we should take a minute here before we kick into the songs. We should say, like, what a great day we had there. And we had a great day because we got to meet Big Star or, you know, the people left from Big Star. Yeah, we yeah, we were uh, we were given a tour of Arden Studios by Jody Stevens himself, the drummer for Big Star. We got to meet John Fry, who was uh, who started Arden Studios and and uh, the original producer, um, the producer on on the first two uh, Big Star albums, number one record in Radio City. And uh, yeah, it was it was. Uh, Definitely an amazing day. It was great. It was uh, it was really great. And I know we're a couple of like nerdy fanboys. I clearly we're not the first people to just walk into Arden Studio and with our you know with our jaws dropped like we'd made a pilgrimage, which we had. Like clearly we are not the only pilgrims to the Arden Studios. If you even have a passing interest, um, and you can get in there, you should go. Uh, and you should go to Memphis anyway. Memphis yeah. is to me for a music lover. I, I can't think of a city that hits above its weight harder than Memphis. It, it, you're right. I want to just take a second. Like we've talked about Stacks before, but we could talk about it every week. The Stacks Museum and that complex they built there is amazing. They finished the Memphis Slim House over there. The Sun Studios are always great. Beale Street's always great. Like there's really nothing to, to that should keep you from spending some quality time in Memphis if you're a music lover. And and if you yeah. and if you love Big Star, all the better. Goner Goner Records too. Got it's a just, it's a great yeah, and and yeah, our pilgrimage was was in the tradition of uh, of others. You know, like the one that I I think uh, is often the story often told is uh, Chris Damey and Mitch Easter of the DBs uh, making their visit to Memphis in order to go to Arden and and try and track down. Uh, you know, at at the time, both uh, Alex Chilton and Chris Bell. Yeah. I, I imagine if we tracked down uh, Alex Chilton, I, what is the old phrase? And uh, you know, never meet your idols. Like I have a feeling uh, he wouldn't have been as happy to see us as we would have been to see uh, him. Uh, mm-hmm. and I, I can't imagine the crap he had to put up with. So uh, all I'm not, I don't mean that as a character flaw on his part. I can't imagine having to deal with what he's had to deal with, especially with, and again, um, there's a chance, Flick, you and I are a little bit obsessive about this stuff. There's a chance that there are people listening who don't know much about Big Star. We didn't talk about maybe doing a quick bio, and I, and I know we want to get into the countdown, but perhaps you could just give a little idea of their history and explain why they're important um, and, and who the players are a little bit. Okay, well, Big Star was was started uh, by Alex Chilton and uh, Chris Bell. Um, Alex Chilton was was famous. He, he, was, uh, he was the leader of the band, The Box Tops, had a big hit with the record, uh, The Letter, um and and they had other hits as well so he was a big deal he was a really big deal but uh uh coming off of that box tops experience he he definitely was looking to take a different path with his music career and uh chris bell was was this guy who you know wasn't so known but but uh was a very talented uh songwriter on on the um on the Memphis uh, music scene, and uh, 
you know, they they formed this uh, partnership that that uh, ended up producing, you know, like one of the all time great debut records, unfortunately. And, you know, and then then two other records that followed with, you know, without Chris Bell. Um, but uh, but Big Star had three records that are three of my all time favorite records uh, that. I think are as good as anything ever made, but but the timing wasn't right. A lot of things went against them. Basically, like everything that could go against them went against them. Yeah. Uh, you know, being how they they had they signed a deal with Stax, and and Stax had a deal going with CBS, and it was just timing of of all of those things was was just the worst because uh, it, it the business end of it really torpedoed. Uh, those big star records and you know they could have been uh they could have been as big as anybody ever and ended yeah. up being a band that nobody had heard of and until you know eventually uh eventually those copies because the distribution was so bad on those records that you know hardly anybody ever got a hold of them but but those who did get a hold of them um were vocal about it and and you know just the fact that uh they were influential to those people that kind of kept this thing going and until at least there was like what you would call a cult following for them yeah i mean but alex chilton in the in the in uh when he was in the box tops he was also very young he was like a child prodigy if you listen to cry like a baby or the letter or soul deep it, it's hard to imagine that was a teenage white boy singing mm. that stuff. Like he was way, way advanced. He was a prodigy and he had incredible success as a very young man. And then he leaves this hit making machine. I mean, those records are like two minutes long. Those were AM radio, perfect slices of just AM pop radio. And then he, he leaves the box tops. And I think his expectation is that he would grow from there. And he really did artistically make big leaps and bounds as a songwriter those there there's not a band i can think of who you know, like not many bands release only three albums but those three albums are perfect there's really mm-hmm. not a ton you could add or subtract to any of them so in a way i think he he left the box tops having every reason to expect that the only way would be up for him especially with those songs and you're right they just got buried in bad business decisions not by them, by other people yeah. and just circumstances. I, I, when we were younger, Flick, like I, big star records were still very hard to find into like the, the 80s. Um, until those Ryko Discs reissues came out, uh, they were really hard to find. And big star was one of those bands that you'd read about more than you'd hear. And that's kind of changed. I mean, you can call shenanigans here, but I, I might venture to say big star is probably never been more popular than they are right now right like that's why finding big star covers is as easy as it is is you how many big star covers are there from the 70s i can't think of one right yeah well yeah we'll talk about kind of the chronology of it to to a certain extent uh as we go through our our playlist um yeah i mean what what put them on the map for me originally i and i think it's the case for a lot of people is uh, the 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 replacement song Alex Chilton um, from the album Please to Meet Me and that was you know that was one of those things where it's just like when I heard that song I was like well who's who's Alex Chilton I gotta know who that is and yeah so I, I that that was kind of I don't I don't know if that uh, comes before like the Bengals uh, version of September Girls or after but anyway well, those are like yeah, that's kind of the representation. REM talked a lot about them uh, in in the early days of REM, um, you know, and 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 that kind of stems from I think the DBs. Um, so yeah, the, the, they had they had a certain prominence I think with with the uh, the members of the Athens Georgia music scene at, at, in in that era. Um, yeah. I think and, and, Sorry, go ahead. When, and a quick thing I wanted to to just mention because you talked about Alex Chilton, you know wh- what uh, he was doing after b- after the box tops, and yeah, I would say you know like one big thing about about his decision to kind of go a different direction from from the box tops is he ha- he had a really hard time getting any of his 
original songs onto a, a box stops album so mm-hmm. i think that that made a lot of difference you know there there aren't you you aren't going to see hardly any alex chilton songwriting credits on those box stops records at all yeah you know at I, I this is maybe an overstatement but i if it is it's not by much i think they are the they are as close to sort of the velvet underground as the as other than the velvet underground like just uh, beloved by artists, the people who heard them in their time were transformed by them. It took a mm-hmm. long time for what they were doing to be appreciated for what it really was. I mean, I, I think there might be people who would wince at the idea of comparing big star song craft to even being like the Beatles level, but it's not far off. It's really yeah, not. I don't, yeah, I, I think that's fair. Um, yeah, I mean, the Beatles... The Beatles did it for a longer period of time, but... but uh, but Big Star had three, you know. It, you and I both agree that those are three perfect records. I don't, I don't, uh, and yeah. you know, if you know the records, I, I kind of feel like you're probably inclined to agree with that. Um, and and as far as that c- comparison with the Velvet Underground, the thing that has always been said about the Velvet Underground is everybody that owned a Velvet Underground record started a band, and and that's it, it is similar in that way. I think I think that's kind of where things went for people that uh people that that enjoyed big star i i think were either people that were in bands or inspired or were inspired to start a band um it it is very similar normally i would ask you to make a playlist of uh of the band so people could get an intro but big star you don't need a playlist you just need the three records i think the live at wlir is also a very rewarding listen um, I'm not sure the reunion record or the the other sort of reunion-y stuff, I'm not sure that's as essential, but I think there that reunion show they did in Columbia, Missouri in the 90s, that was a good set too. And their cover of Todd Rundgren's Slut is fantastic, uh, which I think they did at other times too. But so yeah, they I, did I that, yeah, they did that in their yeah, they did that in their early days. Like uh, the covers that they did in that Columbia set are are the same covers that they did in the days of the band. Yeah. Uh, um, we should also mention, I think, another big reason why, particularly in the early 90s, they were so um, much, it was not just those Ryko Disc reissues, but, and maybe today's not the day to talk about it, we'll, we'll do it another day, but teenage fan clubs bandwagon-esque, people forget, Spin, Record, uh, Spin Magazine voted bandwagon-esque to be the best album of that year. That's the same year, uh, I think it's 91 or 92, that, um, that Nevermind by Nirvana came out. Like mm. that album, that teenage fan club album, Bandwagon Esque, was a very, very important record then, and they were shameless fans of Big Star. And in fact, I think there's there's like tons of stories of the the them seeing uh, Alex Chilton perform in Europe and stuff. Like teenage fan club were nuts for Alex Chilton and Big Star, and they mm. were they were co-signing for Big Star for like an entire year when they had the world's ear. So there was just a time there in the early '90s where. Big Star really got the the cred they deserved, and they really started to um, uh, they really started to become a not just a band popular among artists, but just popular among people who love music. And I, I just I, if you look at the lists you and I both made of covers, a lot of it is no more than ten years old, right? A lot of it is not more than ten years old. They really seem to the Big Star catalog really seems to resonate. So um, I think our lists are pretty good. I think we have a good mix. Um, and I think we're, we have enough genre stuff. I, um, not to be too cute, but I believe we're each doing 13 a piece on this one, right? <laughs> well, I think that was to be cute. <laughs> All right, well, being cute is a little hard uh, for if you have my face. So we'll just say it's, uh, it's an homage. Yeah, it, it's an homage. Um, yeah, and, and, and actually, I would say uh, most of my list is more than 10 years old. All right, well, get started. And we'll we'll cover it as we go. Okay, so yeah, the, uh, so the first one on my list I chose because it, it is kind of the big star song that I think is a good uh, a good entree in, into uh, the world of big star, even though it isn't it isn't from their first album and it isn't uh, it isn't the first track on any big star album, but I think it's a good good intro. And that's September Girls, and and so yeah, this this uh, was done by the Bangles in 1986 on Different Light. So that would have been uh, before Please to Meet Me came out. All right. So they were they were like minded with with the uh, with the replacements. Um, 
also fans, but but really like this is uh this is the earliest big star cover that I'm aware of. I I think we would both agree that Susanna Hoffs is is eligible. I don't know if she's a first ballot covers Hall of Famer, but she belongs in the covers Hall of Fame. Um, I don't think she sings this one though, right? I think this is sung by one of the other Bengals, if I'm not mistaken. Mm, I think I disagree, but but uh, oh, I'll, we, I'll look it up. But keep going. But I yeah. agree too. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. I like the Bengals. I thought uh, going down to Liverpool was a great single. Uh, the what's the the guy from the TV show in Britain who wrote uh, "If She Knew What She Wants"? Uh, Prince wrote for them. The Bengals and the the, the Bengals loved uh, the Hoodoo Gurus and had the Hoodoo Gurus open up for them a bunch. And the Hoodoo Gurus are great. So like the Bengals well, are sort of resembled as a novelty act, but they were yeah. they're legit. Yeah, but but Prince didn't exactly write for them. He he uh, he had a song, and and saw Susanna Hoffs or or one of the other members of the band on an airplane and and passed the song up to her. So, well, so, I, yeah. He, but if you hear the the original, they finally put that original out. I don't know. I if it wasn't written for the Bengals, I can accept that. But it was no accident they got it. Well, he, he gave it to them, but I mean, that's, you know, it's one song that he gave them on an airplane that they both happen to be on. So it was kind of a chance, a chance encounter that resulted in a, a mega hit. I will agree. I think uh, that is the first cover I have heard, I recall hearing of them at the time. And I would guess, other than the cheap trick, the theme to that 70s show, which is also a big star cover, it's just not got the same name. I would say the Bengals cover is probably among the more well known, right? Uh it's yeah, it's hard to say. It is on their greatest hits, so that's going to uh to make a difference. Um mm. but then again, you know, like like a lot of bands, especially bands that are as popular as you know, or or had hits as popular as the Bengals did, I think they're just kind of known for those two or three big hits that they had, uh, you know, the walk like an Egyptian manic Monday and, uh, probably their cover of, uh, hazy shade of winter. Mm, yeah, you're right. Look, I'm not yeah, sad that we got to talk about the bangles. I just, uh, I know that they get treated as, um, I, it was Michelle Steele who did the vocal or Michael Steele. I'm sorry. I don't know. It? I, okay. it was not Susanna Hoffs doing the vocal. If it's Michael Steele, if that's how you pronounce her name, she did a great job. I want to give her. I want to give a shout out to her. I'm angry because this one was on my list. Flick, you got one of my prime ones early. I know we're not doing this in draft format, but mm. all right. I'm. Uh, we. I say bad things about Spotify from here and there, but I'm a heavy, heavy, heavy Spotify user. And if I complain, it's just because there are little things here and there I wish I could change and make it easier for me. Um, there are many things about Spotify I like, and one of the most important ones is the Spotify singles series that they've done over the years, where they have somebody come in and do two songs, an original and a cover. And one of um, my favorite Spotify singles, this is fairly recent vintage, is the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs do a cover of 13 on their Spotify singles. Now, 13 is probably among the better known big star songs. It's certainly among the more covered songs. And uh, I think preferences on covers of 13 is probably down to taste. But uh, Karen O oh is easily one of the most interesting musicians, artists, singers of, of certainly this millennium. And finding out that she also has great taste in music was not surprising. You know what I mean? Like, I just... It's not surprising when you read articles with her and you see who she works with. Like, not only can she deliver the goods on her own material and she can write and she can perform and she is absolutely a dynamo, like live. She is a consummate entertainer. She's the full package. To find out that she also loves the song 13 and can deliver it so sincerely is just one more reason to like Karen O and one more reason to like the yeah, yeah, yeahs. Um, if you don't like the yeah, yeah, yeahs, you gotta try harder. They're great. She's great. This cover is great, so I'm happy to kick it off. I may have to go back to another cover of 13 here and there, but um, I won't say it's the best one, but it's it's currently my favorite. I'm kicking off with it. Okay, well, I'm, I'll just kind of stay in that same vein. There are an awful lot of covers of 13, and that's 
not really com- a complaint, but it's, you know, it's a great song. Uh, so I, I did, uh, I'm, I'm just going to give you the spoiler here that I have more than one of those, but I, but I wanted to limit it to two. So I will, uh, since you gave your, your version of 13, if, I don't know how many you have on your list. I'm going to uh, cut it down. I'll, we'll I'll see how it goes. Go ahead. You can, we uh, should, it's a free fire zone. Okay, so th- this is my first uh, of two versions of 13 that I have on my list. And uh, it's the one done by Garbage um, from uh, the version 2.0 sessions. It didn't didn't actually end up on the album. I don't know if there was any chance that it would. And, and I guess I don't know that it actually was from the studio sessions. I d- don't know specifically where it came from. Uh, but anyway, it's a very good version of it, very good arrangement of it. Um, it... Uh, you know, it, it's it's pretty. I I wouldn't want to go with just the version of thirteen that sounds just like the big star version. I think I think the garbage one is a particularly good example of kind of doing their own thing with it, and uh, but still still being very reverent to the song itself. And uh, yeah, so anyway, it, there are a lot of great versions of this song. This is. Uh, this is one of my two favorites, and that's why it's it's on my list. Yeah, I, uh, Shirley Manson is another one, just um, an alpha. Uh, great taste, great performer. Um, I'm going to cheat a little bit here, and I'm going to I'm going to present a cover. It's um, we didn't discuss formal rules, but I don't think we had to. Both of us, I think, instinctually include the Chris Bell solo output as eligible here. I don't think either of us have yeah. to argue that. The, the no. Chris Bell uh, album. Again, I, I did not know that album until the Ryko Disc reissues, but I love that album to this day. The, and and I, I just, uh, there's so many different permutations of it now, and I've never tired of it. I don't think I'm ever going to. So I'm going to pluck something quick here from the Chris Bell solo uh, album. And this one, uh, we've, we've overdone it with Beck, so I'll keep this brief. There's a uh, deluxe edition of Beck's Hyper space that has some extra material on it one of which is a color a cover of i am the cosmos and i haven't had enough time with it to know if it's going to be timeless or all-time great for me but beck is in my covers hall of fame and i he he's done big star covers plenty in concert over the years he's clearly a big fan this cover is faithful and rev uh and you know it's reverent to some degree um it definitely is beck though you can definitely hear him on it um, you can't go wrong with the source material. If you cover "I Am in the Cosmos" and it sucks, you should not be recording music. Like it's kind of a low bar there when you have such good material to work with. But I think Beck's performance is up to it. I want to recommend it. Beck's cover of "I Am the Cosmos" on the uh, deluxe edition of Hyperspace. All right, uh, my next one um, is uh, let's see. I <laughs> I can't. Um, I added it to my, oh, this is one I added to the wrong list. Okay. So anyway, uh, this is the, uh, Jason Isbell version, Jason Isbell in the 400 unit. I should specify version of, uh, when my baby's beside me, uh, which is, uh, let's see, it's from 2009. So even, even this one is more than 10 years old. I don't, I don't think I have anything on my list that isn't at, at least 10 years old even yeah, well my old. first two were are, are one of them is two weeks old and the other one is like two years old so maybe I'm wrong yeah, well in general but yeah, not on my Beck, own list. yeah the Beck one was just released last week um and he recorded it in April Beck by the way we we, we should have cross talked that a little bit because uh because Beck has has done a few big star covers over the year over the years um He's also done Kangaroo in concert a few times, and uh, well, and he, and he's been doing I Am the Cosmos live for for a few years. Yeah, uh, I buy every Beck record, uh, whether I've heard it or not, and I've never been disappointed. So I'll go buy this new one too, even though I have it. What are you gonna do? It's good. All right, Jason Isbell. I'm gonna. I, I don't know that one very well, but I'm gonna take your word on it. I will definitely dig in on that one. Um, I have to, st- I, I might not do a bunch of different versions of 13 because I am going to do a bunch of versions of Kangaroo. Um, uh, now, you and I both love Big Star and we love all of it. 
But again, you and I end up always looking at the same stuff a little differently. And I would say I do have a clear favorite among the big star records. And because I'm weird, it's Big Star's third. Big Star's third, I do think, is distinct from the other two. It's obvious that it's Alex Chilton. And there is some familiarish stuff in there. But it really is a very different direction artistically for th them, especially compared against the first two records. Um, of, in the same way that the first Velvet Underground launched what I would say almost all of like modern alternative music, I think, has its DNA in the, the Velvet Underground. I think almost everything that's like shoegaze or dream pop or British half of British indie from the 80s, like a lot of that gothy stuff. Uh, uh, I think Big Star's third represents like a branch of the tree that really, really still has not completely been mined. Finding that Shoo Shoo did a cover of a Big Star record is not super surprising, especially because they went to Big Star's third, which I actually think there's a connection between like what Shoo Shoo does and Big Star's third. It makes total sense to me now, we talked about this a little bit beforehand. I love Shushu, or not every single note they've ever made, but when they're great, they're great. And there's the, I know that the, the arrangements can be a little off-putting. It's a little hard on the ears if you're not used to it, but give them a chance. There's real songs in there. They're, that's a, they're great, and you got to give them a chance. They do a ton of covers. Um, I know you don't care for this one, Flick. It is a little bit... Um, it's it's a little on the nose. Like it it takes a song that's pretty bleak to begin with and just buries the needle on the bleakness. But um, that's a that's a language. That's a paradigm Shushu uses. They're great at it. So I have a soft spot for it. I'm gonna ask people to give it a try. It may not be your thing. Give their catalog a try. Try Boy Soprano. Dig up their cover of Under Pressure too. That's another great one. Um, they do a lot of really interesting covers. I'm going to put Kangaroo on there. We'll be back to talk about Kangaroo later, but I want you to feel free to speak your piece on that cover. Well, it's just they, I don't know. It, it's its like they took a song that was strange, and I mean that in the greatest way. It, it, I, I, I love the song. Um, but they took a strange song and decided that they wanted to one-up it, um, or, or seemingly so. And I don't know. I, I, it was weird enough already. It, it's kind of like, you know, the discussions that we've had about uh, camp, Camper Band Beethoven when they did their version of Tusk. Yep. Um, the songs that were already really weird on Tusk uh, don't sound as good when Camper Van Beethoven does, the, does them because they were already weird. They were already Camper Van Beethoven level weird. Um, so what could they really, where could they really go from there? So I don't know. It kind of I agree think. with you. I can agree with you, but nobody goes out of their way to celebrate the weirdness of Big Star to the degree I think they should. Big Star should be third. Should be celebrated for just how left field it is and how well it works. Almost no one on earth could pull that off, other than the Alex Chilton of that time. And I'm just glad someone decided not to do a less weird version, but a more weird version because I love the album for its weirdness and to have somebody celebrate it. I, I enjoy that. So I will take you, I agree with you. I understand what you mean, but allow me to enjoy the celebration of the weird, which you have, you aren't preventing me from, but it's why it's got to be there. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll allow it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me see. My next one is uh, Don't Lie to Me uh, by Julian Hatfield. It was uh, featured on Big Star Small World, a tribute to Big Star. I don't know if that's what it was originally recorded for. A lot of the tracks that are on that that album are not originally intended for that album. So um, I don't know. It's, a, it's an unusual sort of tribute album where uh, they actually collected a lot of stuff that had already existed in the world. And, and uh, so I don't know if much or any of it was actually recorded for the purpose of being on that tribute album. Uh, but as far as I know, this, this one, I, I wasn't aware of it otherwise, though. So We've talked, uh, I think we're both Juliana Hatfield fans, right? We both dig her. Right, yeah. She's great. She's, uh, she would make my covers Hall of Fame. Um, back then, and you got to remember, like, the Blake Babies, I think, were right on the cusp of becoming, like, big alternative band, and they broke up. 
And then Julia Hanfield, uh, I, she had already done like a, a couple indie records, but I think this was right when she signed to like Atlantic for like Juliana Hatfield 3. She was really kind of at the peak of her power in some respects, although I must recommend her. She's a great Twitter follower, or great, I'm sorry, a great Twitter <laughs> follow. Um, and her current music is great. I love her cover records, but her originals are still good. Please give Juliana Hatfield so, uh, a try and the Blake Baby stuff a try. She's really an underrated songwriter and a performer. And I didn't like her all that much when I was young. And someday I, I met her and uh, it was an embarrassing context. Uh, at some uh, Someday we'll talk about it. Not today, but that one was on my list. I really enjoy that. Her cover of uh, Don't Lie to Me is great. Uh, and um, I just, I'm, I'm, I want Juliana Hatfield to get picked up more by uh, some of the younger listeners uh, because she put up with a lot of crap. She put up with a lot of crap. And I think um, she deserves um, more credit for being as pioneering and great as she was. Um, this is as good an intro to her as any, but don't give up. If you like it, work your way through her career. The Juliana Hatfield 3 record's a good place to start. The Blake Baby stuff is a good place to start. Give her a shot. Um, I'm going to go to that album too, just so we can get it out of the way. I agree it's a little weird well, in the way it's put together, wait, but... So, so wait, wait, while while we're still on Julianne Hatfield. Yeah. So there's there's something you didn't mention, and I'll bet it's not on your radar, and it kind of... kind of. Um... Oh, I know what you're going to... Yeah, you can have it. I, I, But I don't think that's that... I don't think that's a great album for either of them, but go ahead. Well, okay, yeah, but but it is interesting, and yeah, I think they, they probably spent a few days making it, so it isn't anything great, but, but I'm talking about the I Don't Cares, which is a combination of Julianna Hatfield and Paul Westerberg. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, it's just one of those things where I think, it, you know, a couple of people that like each other's work uh, decided to get together and, and, you know, mess around and play and, and come up with a few songs, so it isn't... It isn't any uh, landmark artistic achievement or anything like that, but it is fun and a good listen. Yeah, uh, I can't say anything bad about it, but I, I won't say I don't want to pretend like I'm digging out the I Don't Cares record every day. Um, give Julianne a try. And that that we've talked about this before, so we want to hit the, I don't want to hit the point too hard, but a lot of tribute albums are just terrible. I do think uh, this album, uh, The Big Star Small World, is good is a pretty good trade album. I'm going to pluck out from there the Afghan Wigs cover of Nighttime. Admittedly, I love the original Nighttime. It's not covered as often, I think, as it should be. I think it's one of the more beautiful songs uh, that Big Star did. It's one of the points of, I think it's a beautiful little oasis on an album that can be kind of harsh and ugly at some point. The song craft is fantastic. I'm an Afghan Wigs fan in general. Uh, I believe they belong in the Covers Hall of Fame. And um, I was sad that their reunion record didn't uh, blow up. It should have. Uh, Greg Dooley is, um, is really great. And um, his, his reverence uh, is very clear here. And I want reverence in this case. Like, I want them to be respectful but put their own imprint on. And I think he did a perfect job balancing the original with what he can do. Uh, Nighttime by Afghan Wigs from that Big Star Small World tribute. You can't go wrong. I don't think there's a ton of bad stuff on the record altogether, to be honest. Yeah, and, and you, you know, the thing I, I, I did mention, you know, that a lot of that stuff existed in the world. It, it's kind of funny. I don't know the story about how that got put together. But um, a friend of mine and I uh, kind of put together our own little Big Star tribute album uh, of, of all the, the uh, covers that, that we had. Um, and when when this album came out, it was very similar. It, it was like eerily similar to the ones that to the one that we put together. Um, the running order was even very similar. So I don't know. It's it's almost as if uh, somebody. Got, I don't know. I don't want to speculate. But anyway, it was it was eerie. It was eerily similar. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, my okay. So since uh, since we're talking about nighttime, uh, I'm gonna go with my version of nighttime that I have on my list, which was uh, from Tommy Keen. Uh, Tommy Keen uh, did this on a covers album back in uh, 2013, um, which I don't I don't know that he was recording a covers album or if, th if this is like a compilation of covers that Tommy Keen did over the course of his career. Uh, but there's a lot of good good stuff on here. He does uh, Catch the Wind. Um, 
the puppet and, and of course time and you know he uh he sounds his vocals have always sounded very similar to alex chilton i i think uh think he was a huge fan he uh he covered hey little child on uh one of his early albums uh and a great guitarist uh you know speaking of paul westerberg um one of the greatest uh lineups that i ever saw play with paul westerberg live was when he had had tommy keen on lead guitar and uh the way that that he uh he played the solo on on uh i will dare like i, I just remember how how that knocked uh westerberg out and how how uh he you know said something to the effect of that's that's the way he was hoping somebody would play it all along and and tommy keen came along and did it tommy keen was great and and i also saw him play uh guitar for uh, Paul, uh robert pollard uh too um Tommy Keene was was great. So that's that's really all I wanted to say is one of these things uh, you need to make a Tommy Keene playlist because uh, I don't think I can't think of anybody better than you because I'm not sure everybody knows how uh, where to find all of his stuff. You know. Yeah. Well, and not all of it's on Spotify either. Um, there's a lot that's not on Spotify by Tommy Keene. Um, I'm dipping back into the um, Big Stars Third again, and again, I'm not hiding the fact that I love Big Stars Third. Uh, a band I don't know all that much about, Placebo, wasn't really in my ears all that much during their prime years or when they might have been more well-known. But I have gone back over time to listen to them. Uh, and I one of the things I like is they, towards, um, I don't know exactly what year, but they made an album of covers and pretty well-curated list of covers. And the fact that they were, <laughs> they were willing to go in on a song called Holocaust from a very bleak album, that naturally appealed to me. So I'm not a huge placebo fan in general, but just being curious, because I like Big Stars Third so much, I gave this a listen uh, years ago, and it was my intro to them, and it made me like them uh, a lot. Uh, the guy's vocals maybe are a little on the affected side, but if, if you're not singing Holocaust with a uh, an affectation, you're doing it wrong. So um, I give them all the credit in the world for going at such a tough song, uh, being willing to put... I mean, at that time, they were selling... A, a good deal of records to drop a downer like that in. Um, I just, I respect the decision. I think this is the, obviously I love the songs. So I can't complain about the material, but I think that was a pretty uh, big call for them and they nailed it. So I'm going to put uh, placebo's cover of Holocaust up there. Yeah. Well, you know, Alex, Alex Schoen didn't really sing it with an affectation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although the, Everybody goes is a little affected, but all right, you, I get you. <laughs> okay, well, um, all right. So, I, I I kind of broke my playlist into a side one, side two situation. Side one is uh, more the rocking side, the rockers, and then uh, the downers make up side two. So this is my first, or, or excuse me, my last uh, entry into. Uh, the rockers um which is uh which was featured on big star small world but also a track that i was aware of before that that album came out and that's the jim blossoms version of uh back of a car jim blossoms i think at this point are are kind of uh thought of as one of those uh you know nothing bands from the 90s like uh sponge or you know silver chair or something i don't i don't even know uh <laughs> you know but i i think it at least uh in the early days they had a little bit more going on than that uh doug hopkins who unfortunately ended up committing suicide i i think was a really pretty good uh, you know really good songwriting uh pop pop songwriter who uh i i think you know would have been an, an asset to them um going on but but uh but I guess we'll never know about that. Um, but anyway, I, I do like this version of, of Back of a Car. And uh, that's that's my last uh, entry in, into side one of my playlist, if, if, you, if you will. All right. I'm going to um, – I could not break it up into uh, rockers and downers, although the fact that you literally now get to think downs is pretty exciting. I'm going to go uh, – I'm going to pull one I kind of cheated to do. Um, I did browse some other playlists just to see if I was missing anything, and I stumbled upon a band that I know nothing about called Squire, 
They appear to be of uh, a British extraction, I think. I don't know if they were Indie or not, um, but it, it sounds very much, um, uh, it, it, I mean, it wasn't, I, I'm not sure I would describe their sound as uh, particularly original, but Again, another band with some great DNA in terms of the, the references they go for. Uh, they have an entire album called September Girls. Um, the date that it's listed as having gone out is, uh, or been come out is 2019. I don't know if that's right, because they have an entire, covered, uh, an entire covers album that also has September Girls on it, but that's from like 2007. So I'm not sure exactly which version was recorded when, but I, I went for their singles compilation called The Singles Album. I think their cover of September Girls is great. It's not like super propulsive. Um, I really love the uh, that Big Star version on of, of September Girls. I think it's on WLIR the the live version. It, it they really crank it like that. The Bangles version is a little bit laid back, and this version's a little laid back. I maybe we'll talk about uh, more rock and covers at some other time of September Girls. But um, there is like a nice pop arrangement to be done with that song and i think squire got it right so i put it on there september girls it's from their singles album in like 2007 that that'll end my uh, my side one all right and so yeah that that concludes uh our our side ones as well as uh part one of our covers for lovers uh with with the covers of uh, big star and we'll be back with part two uh, which for me it will be the downers, so uh, <laughs> something to look forward to. Uh, but I assure you, all great, great stuff. When I say downers, I, I couldn't be more. I couldn't say that in a more loving way. You're up on downers. I'm up. I'm very are. up on downers. Very. All right. So we promise uh, to be up on downers, uh, and uh, we're going to deliver on those promises the next time we see you. All right. We'll see you in a week.